Nii, tere peale lõunat. Minu nimi on Lauri Lugna ja olen maantametis peadregitud ja asetäit ja liiksoluse ühistranspordi ala. Täna on minu siis hool alla usaldatud meie aastakonverentsi karastlõunane blokk, kus meil tuleb juttu bituumenist, pindamisest, füüsikast ning ühiskondlikust mõjust. Palju erinevaid teemasid erinevate nurkade alt, kuid selleks, et see jääks lihtsalt väga tehniliseks, on plaanis ka tuua sisse mõningat ergutust, sest peale lõunasel ajal ikka seda ole ju vaja. Ja nüüd, kus on suurem osa meie külalistes kerastiga istet võtmas, oleski vast õige aeg sisse võhatada meie pärast lõuna esimene esine, kelleks on professor Simon Hesp. Professor Simon Hesp on meie juurde tulnud Kanadast. Ta on Queen'si ülikooli keemeteaduskonna professor ja see, et ta on Kanadas, ei tähenda, et tal ei oleks kokku puudet Euroopa, nimelt on ta sündinud Hollandis. Tema 25 aastase karjääri jooksul on ta enne kõike keskendunud bituumeni keemia tunnõpimisele Ja ta on tuntud kui väga otsekohane ekspert. Ta toob välja puuduseid, probleeme ja näitab ka lahendusi. Ja enne kõike selles, kuidas on võimalik teede eluiga pikendada. Professor Simon Hesp, the floor is yours. I could not understand any of that, but I'm sure it was all positive and nice. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me today. It's a great pleasure to be in Tartu. As uh, the introduction may have said, I have lived in Tartu before, even though it's my first time in Estonia. Uh, it was Tartu College in Toronto, uh, built by an Estonian community there for students to live. Um, I did my PhD in the University of Toronto. It's uh, 19... 91 I finished there and uh, since then I've been at Queen's University to investigate asphalt materials. I thought as a young academic there's a challenging problem for the Ontario government and for the economy and uh, there should be something we can do about these roads that fail too early. So today I'll talk to you briefly about some of the work that we've done in close collaboration with the Ontario government and numerous municipalities around uh, the province of Ontario. Basically, my focus has been on developing improved asphalt cement specifications. Um, we are in a chemistry department. We do civil engineering type materials research. These are some pictures of the chemistry department. It was built five, six years ago. It's a new building. There are three top floors that have research uh, student labs there. And the two lower floors have undergraduate labs. We have about 25 faculty members in chemistry. And I'm the odd one out. I do civil engineering type material science research in a chemistry department. There's about 100 graduate students, about 1,000 plus undergrads, mainly surface teaching for biology, for medical science, and so on. Queen's itself, it's a medium-sized university in Ontario. It's in Kingston, which is on the eastern part of uh, Lake Ontario, in between Montreal, Ottawa, and Toronto. We have about 20,000 undergraduates, 4,000 grad students, and about 1,000 faculty members. So it's a medium-sized university in North America. So pavement performance, we have found um, that it has varied a great deal, depending on the contracts, depending on the climate, but even for the same climate, the same highway, we have seen dramatic differences between different asphalt pavements. Some last for very long, 20 years, no cracking, reconstruction after 40 or 50 years. And others, they fail early. Uh, within the first year, first winter, we can often see cracking in roads that are paved in Ontario. And just before I left, there were articles in the newspaper about Windsor, Ontario, which is in the corner here. There's Windsor somewhere. Across the border from Detroit. And the city engineer was quoted as saying that within five years he sees a lot of cracking and his pavements have to be re rehabilitated after seven years. And it used to be 15. 
So he has a lot of problems with premature failures and so do others. I was speaking to someone from Timmins. Timmins is in the northern part there. They paved a million dollars worth of asphalt last year and every single project cracked this last winter. So they phoned me and asked me for advice. What's going on? Can we do things better? So the Ontario government has investigated for a very long time pavement materials, asphalt cement, asphalt mixtures, and they've used pavement trials to investigate those materials. So in the 1960s, there were three trials in southwestern Ontario, and they found the same grades of asphalt cement. They performed very differently. 1986, there was a single trial in Bracebridge, Ontario. 1996, there was a trial as part of the SHARP program in the US in Petalawa. And in 2003, they took an interest in my chemistry research and they decided to build four more trials for me. I was able to design those trials and we have actively, we're actively following about 30, 33 test sections. We have investigated a total of 50 test sections over the last 20 years with a main focus on materials chemistry. What happens with this black sticky stuff and why do pavements fail? So this is a video that shows a good example of real life contracts that show from best case to worst case performance. Monkland is just an intersection. It's a gas station on Highway 138 in Eastern Ontario. And this road looks perfectly fine. The shoulder here, there is very little distress. The center line is almost perfect. There is one transverse crack, that's the one, but nothing to speak of. It says about 7,000 cars a day. You go to the other side of Monkland, the intersection, and it is totally the opposite performance. It's identical climate, identical subgrade, identical design of the pavement, except the traffic is 30% less. It's only about 4,000 cars here. And this is the same age of asphalt, but it is cracked all over. As you can see, there was a 60 kilometers of crack ceiling in this pavement within the first five years. And that's excessive cracking and premature cracking. And we want to know why that is. So basically, much of this was around forever. They've had cracks forever in Ontario. But there was a tremendous upsurge in premature failures after the implementation of the superpave specifications for asphalt cement. So superpave stands for superior performing pavements. And it was developed by the US government as a $150 million program of research. And about 50 million of that was developed to develop asphalt cement specifications. It was fully implemented in Ontario in 1998. And these asphalt cement specifications, they're test methods with acceptance criteria. They have now been shown to promote gel type binders. Instead of a viscous material, you have a gel type material that has some elasticity delayed elasticity, and it retains thermal stresses more in the winter time, and therefore it causes more cracking. You can gel asphalt by blowing air through it. Some co companies in Russia do that. Many companies around the world do it. In Poland, in the UK, and everywhere else, they do air blowing. You can put recycled engine oil bottoms in the asphalt cement. It's paraffin oils. They gel the asphalt as well, and that's a big problem in, in Ontario. You can put waxes in. Uh, there's companies that sell waxes to reach higher super paved grades. This XXYY, that's two temperatures. That gives the high temperature performance and the low temperature performance where the pavement is supposed to work. So basically, you can see from best case to worst case scenarios in adjacent contracts with the same identical conditions and designs. And that's what we want to do better at. So. Quality in superpave is designed by this, defined by this XX minus YY. And you can see this is the one day low temperature history over a 50 year period. It's the distribution of the lowest one day in the year over 50 years in a particular climatic zone in blue. Then the red is the average seven day high temperature in the summer for that same pavement over the 50 year design under superpave in that particular climatic region. 
So if you have a 76 minus 28 XXYY, then you have a 98% confidence that at the low end, there is no exposure to damaging temperatures. So you want to protect your road from thermal cracking because once there is a crack, it's very difficult to get rid of. It can go through to the base, water gets in, you get potholes and everything goes downhill from there. So we're interested in this low temperature grade. The YY part of it is what we are focusing on. This graph also shows if you go to a 70 minus 16, you lose about 50% confidence. And in many areas, that even happens at a minus 22. A six degree error, typically in Ontario, you lose 10, 20, 30, 40% in confidence that in a given winter, there's no damage to your pavement. So basically, it is very critical that you get this low temperature number correct. If it is not correct, you can get premature and excessive cracking, as was shown in the video. So asphalt pavements, it's 5% the asphalt cement, the binder, the bitumen, and that's the glue that holds the aggregate together. 95% on the right is aggregate. This is basically aggregate, it's coarse aggregate, it's sand, it's filler. But the asphalt cement is 5 to 6% by weight, and it, it causes, it is mainly responsible for preventing the cracking. Fatigue cracking in the wheel path, transverse cracking due to thermal stresses, is by 90% dominated by the properties of the asphalt cement. Rutting, the formation of ruts in the wheel path, is 90% related to the aggregate structure, the mixed design. So we are focusing as a chemist on the asphalt cement, the black sticky stuff. So performance grading happens in the lab. You have a sample and you want to predict, okay, will it pass the test? Will it withstand the temperatures and the weather outside on the road? So we have a can of asphalt and basically we put it in an oven and we age it in a rolling tin film oven. And then we age it in a pressure aging vessel. And it's a pressure cooker, like in your kitchen for 20 hours at 100 degrees, we cook it. And then all those residues, the unaged material, and the RTFO material and the PAV material is measured in a dynamic shear rheometer to measure the resistance to flow. And it is also measured in a bending beam rheometer to measure the resistance to, well, to measure the, the ability to flow at low temperatures. At low temperatures, you want a viscous material rather than an elastic material. So you want it to flow. And depending on whether these properties are measuring above or below certain acceptance criteria, we can get a minus 28 grade or a minus 34 grade or a minus 40 grade. And a minus 40 grade is supposed to withstand minus 40 degrees in the winter in northern Ontario and in maybe some places in Russia. A minus 34 grade should be sufficient for the coldest parts of Estonia. A minus 28 grade should be sufficient for the coastal areas in the Baltics. So SuperPave rewards different crude oils differently. In this graph, we have plotted the high temperature grade XX versus the low temperature grade YY. And we can see if we have a Cold Lake crude from Alberta, we follow the line in green. C1 is a soft cut, C2 is a harder cut, C3 and C4 are even harder cuts. They are distilled to higher temperatures. So you get a harder material. What this graph shows, though, is that you cannot move away from that line. Cold Lake is fixed to that green line. Bow River in blue is fixed to the blue line. Peace River is fixed to the red line here. And the sum of these two numbers gives you the grade span, and that's a measure of quality and superpave. The higher the grade span, the better it will do at both winter and summer times, if this were correct. The problem is with the implementation of SuperPave, there were some shortcuts made and people have tried to simplify it and they have made mistakes that have led to a lot of premature failures that we have investigated. One of the ways that they use shortcuts is contractors and suppliers of asphalt cement always want to be economical, they want to have low costs and charge a high price. So a very easy way to reduce your cost is to dilute the asphalt cement, the binder, with waste engine oil residues. Engine oil in North America is mainly recycled, 
and the recycling where 80% goes back into engines and 20% the sludge, the black, stick, not sticky stuff, it's a lubricant that is thrown all into the asphalt cement supply. And we detect it by looking for zinc in an X-ray spectrum. Oh. And the zinc here is that big peak at 8.64 kilo electron volts. And this is the molecule that is in your engine. It is added to an engine to prevent wear. It's an anti-friction additive and it's an antioxidant as well. So we use this zinc peak in the X-ray spectrum just as a signature. It's nothing to do with the properties or the performance. It's a signature that there is engine oil in the asphalt cement. And engine oil is largely paraffinic. It's a lubricant, so it doesn't stick very well to aggregate particles, and you get premature cracking. The poor performing section, the contract that I showed on the video, it was tainted with used lubricant oils. 50% of the asphalt cement in Ontario is tainted with lubricant oils, up to 15, 20%. This particular sample that was offered to the ministry, E009, we estimated it had 35 to 40% used lubricant oil residue. In it. So basically, you're no longer talking about an adhesive, you're talking about a lubricant. So basically, the other thing that lubricants do is they sweat. They sweat out of the asphalt cement. When the asphalt cement, the binder, shrinks in the winter, the paraffin oils from the lubricant, they come out of the droplets. And you can see this in an Australian exudation test. These three samples here, they sweat a lot, and these two are much better. And it's the paraffin oils that let go of the aggregate. And lubricant oil is mainly paraffinic. So you don't want to do that, but it is everywhere. In the United States, there's 20 to 30 percent of the asphalt cement tests positive for lubricant oil, 5 to 10 percent. Northern Ontario, 15, 20 percent. It's a huge problem as a direct consequence of the superpave specifications, because superpave doesn't look at exudation, they don't talk about it and it is a main failure mechanism in these kind of asphalt cements. So we have focused not on making better asphalt cement that's left to industry. We have focused on rewarding better asphalt cement with better specifications. So we have three laboratory standards. LS stands for Laboratory Standards 299, which is known as the DENT test. It's the double edge notch tension test. And it gives an improved measure of ductility. Ductility has been measured for 100 years in asphalt. We developed a DEM test in 2006, the first publications. It has been implemented in the Ontario asphalt cement industry and is now used for acceptance purposes. The extended BBR has been discussed for 100 years in the asphalt cement literature, but no one cools the sample sufficient long. If you cool it for an hour, you're wasting your time. If you cool them for a day or three days, you learn how asphalt cement hardens physically or how it shrinks, how it becomes more stiff. That is an extreme improvement over a one-hour test. However, Superpave, they had a 24-hour test, but the industry lobbied hard to get rid of it. And no one is doing it today except in Ontario, the Ontario government and a lot of municipalities starting to test for one hour 24 hours and 72 hours, and we can avoid many premature failures. The last method we have developed is a modified pressure cooker, and that has also been discussed. I will not go into that today. So double edge notch tension, we have a dog bone, uh, a double edge notch specimen with notches on either side, and there's a ligament L, and L varies from 5 to 10 to 15. We measure the total work of failure, which is the area under the force displacement curve. That is comprised of an essential work to make the new surface and a plastic work or a non-essential work. That's the energy absorbed away from that surface. Now you can write that in specific terms times an area. The cross-sectional area of the ligament is B times L. The plastic work scales with a volume around the ligament which is B beta times B times L squared. You divide by BL and you get a straight line relationship which gives you a specific total work of failure, small w total, is equal to the essential work of failure, P 
plus beta times the plastic works times L. So if you plot the total specific work of failure versus the ligament length, you get the intercept of essential work, and you get the slope being the plastic work. Then we divide that by a net section stress in the smallest ligament, we get a ductility of a tiny hair of asphalt cement that we fail. And that's as it happens in the mixture in the road. We fail when that fiber fails, when it breaks. If the fiber can stretch under the going traffic further, then the subgrade can respond with a compressive stress and we don't have any failure. So the CTOD is an improved ductility test of very tiny fibers. We cannot directly measure them, but we can extrapolate to zero ligament and we can indirectly measure them. So basically we set our limit that we are just above the brittle to ductile transition. On the left, we have a brittle failure here, and then it becomes a little bit ductile at the end. It pulls out a little bit. And on the right, we have a fully ductile material. So if we ask a supplier to produce a sample for paving, we want it always to be ductile. So it doesn't fail in a brittle fashion, and it doesn't fail at low temperatures or in fatigue in the wheel path. This test method has been validated with the Federal Highway Administration Accelerated Loading Facility in McLean, Virginia. And they spent basically $25,000 on it. They gave the money to me to develop the test method. And lo and behold, for their $2 million study, we came out on top. The critical crack tip opening displacement, or CTOD, it did best in the ALF cracking, and it did best in the lap as well. A composite score of 0.99 versus a composite score of 0.75 for the super pave criteria for fatigue cracking. So we have good correlation with accelerated loading tests in very expensive facilities in Washington, D.C. area. We have also invalidated in real-life pavement uh, contracts, not trials, regular contracts. We have extracted the asphalt cement, and we found that pavements that didn't crack, all these here, they showed very high CTODs, relatively high. Those that cracked, we showed that there were a lot of very low CTOD, brittle type of materials. Basically, when there's cracking, it becomes brittle, the asphalt cement. So it wasn't 100% accurate, so we also have to look at the low temperature and the aging properties of the asphalt cement, and why we have LS308 and 220H. So LS229, we have the criteria for acceptance for a minus 28 zone. We have a 10 millimeter limit. For a minus 34 zone, we have 14, and a minus 40 zone, we have 18. And those limits were really pushed down by the industry. They have lobbied very hard to keep those limits as low as possible. Now, we have some improvement from the previous situation because we would test samples at 4 or 5 millimeters in the Toronto area, and they were totally gone before they were used. But I can tell you, I can easily make 20, 30, 40, 50 millimeters, whatever you want, I can make it for you for a very reasonable price. But the industry is not interested in jacking those things up because they want to be economical, they want to have a low cost for their materials and sell it to you at the best possible price. Round robin testing has happened, 16 labs participating, we had coefficients of variation of 10 and 14 percent roughly. And that is as good as it gets for a failure test. It doesn't get any better. It doesn't need to get any better because, as I said, I can easily make you 20, 30, 40, 50 millimeter CTODs. And I've modified some Estonian asphalts for Carly Thompson, and we can get very interesting results. These are an Estonian asphalt that I modified. One on the left here, we added 5% of a dye block copolymer that is commercially available, is used extensively in the asphalt industry. And we get this 66 minus 34 grade with an intermediate temperature of 11. And then I can ox uh, add oxidized polyethylene with some engine oil, our EOB. And you can get a very similar superpave grade. But you can see these graphs of the forced ductility, the forced displacement, they look very different. So the question in the past would have been, well, what do I want, a strong one or a, or a less strong material that stretches a bit more? We can do the essential work of failure analysis, and we can see that the CTODs, they vary by almost a factor of two. In green is the SB dye block modified material, identical super, grade, super paved grade span, 
And in red is the oxidized polyethylene with the waste engine oil. It's very, very different and much inferior. It cannot stretch very much before the, the filament, the fibers, they fail. So you get cracking much more early. And I'll show you in a minute what that means. So the extended BBR, LS308, it conditions at 10 and 20 degrees for one hour, 24 hours, and 72 hours above the pavement design temperature. So for Tartu, it may be minus 34. The performance grade, you condition it at minus 24 and at minus 14 to see how the asphalt cement hardens in time over the 72 hours. You don't just want to look at how stiff it is at one hour. You want to see how stiff is it after 24 hours and after 72 hours. And then you want to measure that grade loss from one hour that gives you a measure of durability. We want to have asphalt in a Tartu area that is durable. Minus 34, it's required when it gets to minus 34. So we don't want it to lose its grade in time during the winter. So physical hardening has been discussed for a very long time in the literature. 1936, Traxler and co-workers from uh, the Barber Asphalt Company in the US. He became a professor at Texas A&M University. And he was very good. Basically, he said, Hardening due to volatilization or chemical reaction is what we always study in asphalt and bitumen research. It is small in comparison to that due to the structure which develops. Physical hardening develops a structure within days. And he said it is small, the chemical hardening, compared to the physical hardening. Today in North America, only some municipalities and the Ontario government are looking at physical hardening. Everyone else ignores it. And I can use my thumb to grade the asphalt. If I ignore physical hardening, I may as well use my thumb. I can tell you, okay, this is soft enough, you can use it. If you use expensive equipment, you should utilize it to the fullest extent. You've spent a million euros on a kilometer of road. Why try to save $10,000, $5,000 on testing your asphalt cement to guarantee that it at least will function for 10, 20 years? Blocker and Van Horn were two shell researchers in Amsterdam. They published, a, they coined the term physical hardening. And Strauch in 1978, another Dutchman, he said it is of little use to measure creep if one ignores the aging effect. So the entire asphalt industry in North America is measuring creep, but they totally ignore the aging effect, the physical hardening effect. And that's why the roads still look pretty bad when you get to Ontario. You visited Toronto recently, um, what you don't know is that there are many, many failures there that occur in three, four, five years. And they have to replace entire freeways that cost 10, 20, 30 million dollar hit to the Ontario economy. So this is Trax's data. 1936, he showed that air blown asphalt used here, sold here, produced by our neighbors, it can harden much more than straight run asphalt, which is straight distillation residue. And this particular sample, it aged by a degree that increased in stiffness in 300% in 200 days. That was at room temperature. We measure it at low temperature where it goes much faster. So we have validated it in the field with real pavement trials, 500 meter long sections, a kilometer long sections in La Monte. This was the contribution of Canada to the SHARP program. It's known as the C-SHARP program. There were trials in La Monte, in Ontario, and in Quebec. And here you can see the cracking severity versus the M320 grade. There is very little sensitivity. This one does as well in the grading as that one, but that one has a lot more cracking. This is air-blown asphalt, and that's a waxy asphalt. After three days of conditioning, the grade losses range from 10 to 14 degrees. Remember the confidence from 12 degree loss will bring you from 98% confidence to close to 0% confidence. And this trial has shown that that is correct. Because this road, this test section 5, 1, and 4, they cracked a great deal more than what their low temperature grades indicated. They should have cracked. So basically what happens in the asphalt cement, this is a fiber of asphalt irradiated under an electron microscope to volatilize the oils. And you can see it was oriented, the fiber, 
So the asphaltine structure is exposed. When the oils are evaporated, you see asphaltines that don't volatilize. And you can see that structure, it strengthens, it stiffens at low temperature. When you condition this, more material precipitates on this structure and you get less stress relaxation. You get more cracking because the thermal stresses, they remain high in the road during the winter. Again, we have validated it with Ontario regular contracts and we see those asphalt cements that lose very little over three days. The grade loss in LS308 at minus 10 is less than three degrees. They virtually show no cracking. And those that lost more than three degrees, they show a lot of cracking. And we have seen grade losses of 10, 12, 14 degrees on premature failures. A lot of it has to do with the use of waste engine oil residue, waxes, air blowing, and a whole bunch of other things, recycled asphalt they put in. But with used motor oil flux in Cold Lake, you can add it to the asphalt cement and it softens the asphalt. The low temperature grade goes down in blue. And this was the sample of which I just showed you the X-ray spectrum with an estimated 40% of used motor oil. When you condition it for three days, the limiting temperatures, the grade goes up. And basically what you're doing is you're under-designing your pavement. If you think you have a minus 34, you really have a minus 28. You're using it in a minus 34 area. It cracks after five, six, seven years. The problem in Ontario has been that contractors have now been adding more recycled asphalt pavement. Suppliers have been adding motor oil, waxes, air blowing. And the situation is so bad now, there's many failures in the first winter and life cycles have gone from 15 to 20 years down to 10 or less. Many freeway contracts have been replaced with five years of service. And it's a bit too costly for any government to sustain. This is our trial data in Timmins. Again, we had seven test sections. The first winter, we were very lucky, it reached minus 48 degrees centigrade on this location. I had loggers in the pavement, loggers in the trees, and we reached minus 48 degrees centigrade, a record low temperature for the area. Just south from there, the minimum ever recorded in Canada has been minus 58 degrees centigrade. I don't believe that, but it is an Environment Canada website. So basically, we were lucky. In the first year, it got very cold. And I had designed the pavement trial to all withstand minus 34 on the surface. So the air temperature was minus 48. We measured on two days, the surface temperature was minus 34. So it was exactly designed, all the seven test sections, with the PAV and one hour of cooling in the BBR, to withstand minus 34, because they're all between minus 34 and 36. And the PAV is supposed to prevent cracking 10-year-old pavement. And this was one year old. So we extracted in 2011, and we recovered the asphalt cement, and we graded them again in one hour cooling and at 72 hour cooling. So you can see whereas the predictive ability at regular ASHTO grading, super paved grading, is zero. The R square is 0.1339. It judges them all to be the exact same grades. The cracking ranges from almost zero to massive. Recovered grades do a lot better to predict the performance. The R squared grows up to 0.87, which is very good. But even after three days condition, it, it gets even better because the range doubles from about 10 degree range from the best to the worst. It goes to about a 17 degree range from the best to the worst. So the test after 72 hours becomes more sensitive to predict cracking, more accurate to predict cracking. And that's what we want. So there's 10 to 20 degree errors in this pavement trial, and that's basically something that must be improved. So mix hardening or softening, when the asphalt cement, the bitumen, when it shrinks, it can really let go of the coarse aggregate. This is an interface that has failed, and then you get tangential cracks going into the mastic, the bitumen with the filler. So this crack here lets water into the pavement, and if you do a freeze-thaw cycling, and then you look at the normalized indirect tensile strength at 60 degrees, you go from something that 
passes with an 80% retained tensile strength to something that fails miserably with only a 30% retained tensile strength. So the free stuff finishes off the pavement. After a very cold spell, the aggregate interface has let go, and the free stuff finishes off the pavement. And you can see these are two pictures of the same trial. This section here has virtually no distress, 160 meters in the 500 meters of road, and that's mainly through pore holes where we took samples. This one is completely falling apart, and it is, uh, that was only five years of age. This was in 2011, or eight years of age, I think. So this was a gel-type asphalt cement. It highly physically hardens. It has a high penetration index. Our value oxidative hardening is high. It is controlled by the M value in the BBR, and it has a low CTLD. And this is a salt-type asphalt, a liquid, viscous material, and that is much better. <coughs> Perfectly fine. It will go for another 20 years, if not 30, before they have to reconstruct it. This is a low volume road with about a thousand cars a day, mainly logging trucks and mining trucks. But adjacent test sections, identical superpaved grades, you decide what you want. A lot of the engine oil problems is due to this exudation effects, and we test the samples in the lab, and they sometimes come out clean from the brass inserts. We just wiggle it, and it comes out clean. That's the lubricant effect of used motor oil. The problem with the superbase is it does not test samples enough for these kind of fa factors, and we have to be very careful. So LS308 has been implemented for a minus 28 zone. We want a minus 28 after three days. For a minus 34 zone, we want a minus 34 degree grade after three days. We want that grade to be accurate, as the trial data has shown validation data have shown the superpay foundation is sound. It works, but not after one hour of conditioning, not after PAV aging and 3.2 millimeter thick films. We have to use thinner films, and we have to make a few minor improvements with a ductility test such as LS299, and you can do it a whole lot better. Grade losses should stay below 6 degrees. Really, it should be 3 degrees. We can get you 1 degree grade loss. But the industry, again, has pushed very hard to keep that grade loss number high and to somewhat lessen the severity of the specification. You can have very good tests, weak specifications, still get cracking in the road. We've done round-robin testing, 70 labs participating, very good results, 2.8 degree plus or minus 0.8 for the grade loss. That's extremely good. Some Estonian miners. We have one from Venezuela almost zero degree grade loss. That is the best asphalt you can get in the world from Laguna, Venezuela. It's only available through certain companies, so that's why it costs more. Don't ever ask me to say and tell you how much can I afford to spend on asphalt cement if I want a life cycle of 25 years, 30 years. That's cost-benefit analysis, and I always ask people in the government I said, tell me, how much can we afford more if I can get you an extra 10 years out of the life cycle of your road? And I never got a straight answer. But in this day and age, with prices being very high, sustainability being a very big, hot topic, my main answer has been just try to do the best you can. Try to spend a little bit more. Don't have people rob you, but pay a little bit more to get a lot extra is putting in motor oil to say $50 and then it costs you $500, that is not good common sense. The R binders are all from Russia, I believe, and they lose 6.65, 7.1, and these are on regular PAV residues, so it looks pretty much similar to Ontario marketplace. Far from ideal, but not the very worst either. If you have very big premature failures, I can guarantee you very often the asphalt cement has something to do with it. We have measured losses of 10, 12, 15 degrees. So that comes close to the end of my presentation. That bell is to scare off the black bears in northern Ontario. This is a test section that is southerly from the first trial. We paved this in 2007. 
so it's seven, eight years old now. And the centerline joint, I've taken a videotape, is nearly perfect. This is the same highway, 655. We have added fibers to a good quality asphalt cement, and this is indestructible. It, uh, it will go probably well beyond the normal life cycle of pavements. You've got a very small amount of recycled polyester terephthalate fibers from pop and water bottles, and you can make them extremely tough asphalt mixes at low temperatures. This is a thousand cars a day. We have five test sections in downtown Toronto, the road from the airport to downtown, Highway 427. It's the second busiest in Canada with three, four hundred thousand cars a day. We have test sections with polyester terephthalate fibers that are also extremely good and performing very well. So there's room for innovation. You can do things better, especially with regards to testing your asphalt cement, your bitumen. You can be sold things that look black, that smell like asphalt, that feel like asphalt, but really are partially lubricants. Or you can put in place certain stricter criteria and uh, you can get much better long life lasting roads. My research is sponsored about 25% by industry, large big chemical companies and oil companies. They give money, usually without any pretty much always without any requirements. They just want to know what I'm thinking about and they want to have uh, licenses for things that I would develop. I never patent anything, so that's good because they just give me the money and they don't ask anything about it. 25% comes from the Ontario government and about 50% comes from the federal government in Ottawa, which is the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council. They give a lot of matched funding for industry money. So it is difficult. I cannot scream out too loudly, but I'm in Estonia here and no one is listening. The situation in the asphalt industry in Ontario is pretty bad. A lot of it has to do with the super pave implementation. Um, the good news is that we can do much better and that the politicians are listening too. After a few freeway failures, they are getting a bit nervous and they say, well, maybe this is the time to change things. It's been implemented since 98, which is uh, 17 years. That's a long time. And very rapidly after the implementation, we started to see these types of failures, which we had never seen before with penetration when in ball testing. There was no great incentive to increase that grade span. Cold Lake would always do the job, the refinery makes it pure, it was resold to the user agencies for a reasonable price. But competition goes up, people become more desperate, they start to do strange things and crazy things and uh, it's time to change, the municipalities are changing. In Ontario it's uh, Waterloo region, Niagara region, York, Beale, Durham region, Timmins, Kingston, Ottawa is thinking about it. And mainly because the failures have been pervasive all over the place and in very large numbers and high costs. So, super is sound, you can do it correctly, and you can build probably superior performing pavements, but you have to do it right. No shortcuts, no materials that should never be in asphalt, it should be put in asphalt. It should be an adhesive, not a lubricant adhesive, whatever you want to call it. That's why I would like to end my presentation. So if you have any questions, feel free. Uh, don't worry about asking questions that may seem simple or difficult, or I'll try my best. Thank you, Professor Peterson. Because uh, with this, you have almost no regrets. On that's the right thing, Monsieur. Ette võite te poole pealt võib olla. Konkurentsioolu kord on Kanadas muutumas, ehkki on silma piiril mõned väärivaatud. Paistavad praegu küsimuse üle, but uh, I have one question, uh, professor. Jaa, palun. As you have tested Estonian used uh, asphalts, yes, uh, what do you expect, expect that uh, could be, uh, uh, how to say, increase of 
cost of B2, if we could uh, improve our requirements according to your recommendations? Thanks. Well, there are basically several types of Estonian asphalt, vigilance, and some are not so good, sort of average in Ontario market. And there's two that I've tested that are probably as good as it gets. They are used in Scandinavian countries, and they are from Venezuelan crew that are absolutely fabulous, but they will charge more. These are the companies that want to make a living, so they know they have something good, they'll charge more. Um, in Ontario marketplace, the difference has not been significant. There has been no noticeable change in costs for those municipalities that have implemented the new test methods. Because basically what happens, they want to contract. They want to contract, they will bid competitively. And if it is an economic downturn, as it has been since 2009 in North America, they always want to contract. So there's been no noticeable difference. If you put an average engine oil content in Ontario at maybe 10%, that would be $50 a ton of asphalt cement extra if you take that out, maximum. For a reseller who pays $500 to a refiner and then charges $600 for modification and charges $600 to the user, that extra $50 is gold. It is massive. It is an absolutely astronomical increase of his profit margin. It's maybe double. But for the user, he sees $600 or $650. That is totally insignificant on the asphalt mixture, which is only 5% by weight of asphalt cement. So on the whole, the question of cost and benefit, I tell people, I've spoken and have asked many times, tell me what are the required cost implications. No one gives me a clear answer. <laughs> the question is, do you want to do this right or not? A lot of the Russian crudes have wax in them. Wax is crystallized at low temperature. They perform more poorly. The Venezuelan crude is much better. It has almost zero wax, but it costs <coughs> more. I would have seen evidence of superior performing pavements in Estonia. I have not seen I have not looked for it. But it's critical for government to monitor its performance of all the roads and link it to asphalt cement properties. Because Venezuelan doesn't mean it's always good, they could be adding some other Russian crude to in the mix to run the refinery more efficiently. They need to make jet fuel, they make to make, need to make lubricants. It's not just what they say you are getting, it is what you are getting. You need to know and you need to monitor your network. Early failures spent the money to investigate get to the bottom of it in Ontario very often. We were the first one to publish five or six papers on waste engine oil. We found out there were others that knew about it. Many of the people in the industry, they knew, the suppliers, but they didn't talk about it. So now everyone is talking about it. In the US and New England states, they banned it immediately. They got sued by, an by a Canadian company. Asphalt cement supplier suing its own customers, being the US government. That's not smart. So they dropped the lawsuit and in New England, engine oil is banned. But next, they could be getting tall oil from a pulp and paper mill. They could be getting vegetable oil, lots of vegetable oil patents out there. Arthur Daniel Midland Company, the big agricultural companies, has patents on vegetable oil in asphalt. What do you think it does? Not a good thing, according to me as a chemist. Yeah? So you need to test. You need to be on top of it, and it doesn't cost much. You spend a million euros on a kilometer of road, you spend 10,000 on the testing, that is nothing. But be sure and train your own staff that they are fully competent. The best thing that Estonia did was send three, four, five of your guys to the US, to Canada, they came to visit me, Wisconsin, Federal Highway Administration. They got very different opinions in different places, but they're smart enough to make decisions for themselves on what is right and what is wrong. If you are entering a new phase where you are hopefully getting to better specifications, you need to be educated, you need to know what other people have done. What I see with a great deal of uh, worry is that in Europe, in the European Union, it seems again that the specification 
process, the development process for new specification and acceptance criteria is heavily influenced by the suppliers and the big oil companies because of course they want specifications that are extremely lenient and la relaxed because they can meet it with all sorts of different outcomes. Yeah? Whereas as a government you need to make a decision, I want to spend a million, dollars, mil million euros on my road, I want minimal performance that is at least 15, 20, 30, 40 years probably. And in my opinion, it should be 40, 50 years, because how much longer do we have crude oil to make asphalt cement? The known reserves, it's yeah, exactly 53 years. It's nothing. So we'll have to end up eventually with concrete everywhere. But. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. And uh, let's give you a bit of applause. As in Canada, the weather is similar in Estonia, so uh, thank you for your speech and uh, small present as well.